Hi, this is Tom Landry from Benchmark Real Estate. I'm here with Roy Pierce of Jensen Baird. And we're here to talk today about Portland's revaluation. Um, and we have a, a live group here. Obviously, we have some folks uh, tuning in. Um, and uh, we have our friend, virtually, Charlie Katzlevy, also of Jensen Baird. And hopefully everybody can see that. We tried to make this all work uh, with um, you know, blending um, uh, online and, and blending uh, in person. So uh, today we have about an hour of time. Uh, we are going to, again, we're on Facebook Live, so people can comment, people can share questions, and, um, and, and we will get to those questions in the second half of the program. We're probably going to have about uh, a half an hour of this dedicated uh, to um, some type of presentation and a review of what's happening in the city right now. And then afterwards, we're going to field questions um, that have come in already to our team and questions that may come in as we go through the process. Uh, obviously, we're going to turn it over to the folks that have showed up in person and answer some of their questions that they have as well. Um, Roy, do you just want to introduce yourself a little bit, what you do? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Roy Pierce. I am an attorney at Jensen Baird here in Portland. Uh, I am primarily a litigator. Uh, a lot of what I do uh, involves real estate litigation, and I do uh, litigate once we hear a few minutes from now about the process uh, in terms of tax abatements once we get into the uh, court realm and outside of the you know, municipal board assessment. Charlie, you want to share a little bit about your practice? Sure. Thanks, Tom. Um, my name is Charlie Katzlevy. I'm a real estate attorney at Jensen Beard. I primarily handle uh, commercial and residential transactions, whether they be purchases, sales, leasing, development work, financing, etc. Uh, I know enough about property taxes um, to have been hired on a number of occasions to assist clients with uh, abatement applications. And the abatement process is a two-step process. One has to do with real estate evaluation. The other part has a litigation component. So very often you'll find someone like me working with someone like Roy um, on that, as well as the um, consultants who can do the valuations, folks like Tom. So um, that's my role in this, uh, in this production. Thank you, Charlie. So uh, as a brief uh, point of introduction, uh, the goal of today is really to address some of what I was seeing and feeling uh, over the last week uh, as people started to receive their tax bills and the reevaluation. So, um, you know, I got a first email uh, as they first came in, and then literally I probably had 30 emails and, and probably 10 or 15 phone calls from clients, friends. Uh, as many of you know, I've had an office on the East End uh, for almost 20 years now. We were up on uh, 100 Congress Street for a long period of time, and the office we're conducting this meeting in is at, at, on Washington Avenue on the East End. So uh, why I comment about the East End is it seems to be the area where we're seeing the most appreciation in values comparatively to the last time the valuation has happened. So the goal of today really is not to get into why a revaluation happens. Many of you listening now or people who have been in the city of Portland over the last two or three years have received uh, several communications from the city as to here's how we do it, here's why we do it. Uh, we're not going to get into that. Uh, really what we're talking about now is now that you've received this, and, and this is again a response to uh, if I'm dealing with 30 or 40 or 50 people, uh, it's probably reflective of three or four times that who have received these bills uh, are lacking some level of information or understanding and want to understand how to navigate. Um, the city actually has some really good information on their website. Uh, they picked it up directly from Tyler Tech and put it there. And it's fairly easy to navigate. However, not everybody is comfortable with those interfaces. So we're trying to bring some of that into very clear language and you don't have to go multiple pages in to figure out how to, how to do things. The other part is when we're talking about the appeal process, it is a very, very tight timeline. Um, as we know, due to COVID, the tax uh, revaluation and the introduction of this was delayed by about a year and it's just come out now. Now, part of the anxiety that I think people are feeling is the, the uh, 
the appeal or the informal appeal process closes on August 6th. So you just got it and you have to quickly work to get some information uh, to them. You have to quickly book your appointment and the deadline for booking your appointment is July 21st. So all of these things have to happen in a very rapid succession to people who are receiving these, um, uh, who may have the capacity to, to do some of the stuff that's required and may not. And as Charlie said, um, you know, what we typically are doing and what uh, I'm helping folks out with, for, for example, um, I had a, a woman who I uh, sold a three unit on the East End for, and she contacted me, uh, indicated that her value for her now condo, because she took her three unit, converted it to condos, kept one of the units, uh, was now at over $900,000. Now this is a uh, older building, uh, triple decker, and she said to me, Tom, I was bracing for the value to go from about 400 to maybe six, 650, but nine just doesn't feel right. Is, is, am I, is that correct? Does that seem a little high to you? And right away, knowing her building, knowing her unit, I said, absolutely, it seems significantly high. So uh, what we were able to do with that is quickly help her. Uh, we took some pictures of the unit, uh, which is part of what the city is saying you need to be doing. And we were able to do a, a market analysis or a broker opinion of value. So we were able to say, hey, based on my experience, based on you know, selling a tremendous amount of real estate in Portland over the last 20 years, I have a very good and broad knowledge of what that property is going to be worth. So I can quickly do an assessment of that. I can give her a little bit more information in a document that I sign that says, here's the value I place that at. So, Beyond that, we're also able to give her comps, and, and this is part of what is important, and this is what they're saying that you have to do uh, if you want to appeal that process. So on the real estate side, we're already taking these actions, um, but we're also here and letting people know that uh, based on your circumstance, we can also help you on that as well. Um, Mary Hanks. I don't know if you guys can still see us or not. The screen just went, um, uh, went blank. I assume you can. So that's the sort of introduction. We have some documents that we'll make available online. One of them is the summary sheet, which explains uh, the property taxes and what I was saying. We're really not going to get into this idea of why do we do it, uh, what happens with that. And, but we have something that's a lot more uh, uh, meaningful to the process right now, which is called the informal appeal process. And then we get into, again, what Benchmark can do and what others can do to help. So that's the introduction uh, to what we're going to be talking about today. And again, I envision this as a half and half meeting where we're going to talk a little bit but it's more about you. It's more about the people on, online and in Portland who couldn't make it today uh, live and the folks in our audience. So I'll turn it over to Roy to, to take it from there. Do we want to go through the process? Yeah, I think that's probably uh, the Charlie uh, for Charlie okay. at this point. So let me jump into a little bit about the process of what you, the owner, the taxpayer can do. So as Tom has talked about, there is an informal appeal process that started right now. And you have the ability to schedule an appointment with Tyler Technologies, the consultant that the city of Portland hired, and go through what's called an informal appeal, where you present your best evidence to try and challenge the assessed valuation. Now it's important to remember, the fact that the valuation of the property went up does not necessarily mean your taxes went up. As a matter of fact, the mill rate went down considerably. And so it's possible that the valuation went up and the property taxes stayed flat or went down. Um, so that's one thing I think that is important to keep in mind. Um, there are basically two requirements when a municipality taxes someone. One is that the tax represents just value, which is called fair market value. And the other is that they didn't discriminate among taxpayers. So when you're presenting your evidence to Tyler, you're, you're making one of two arguments. Either that for some reason they've discriminated against you and been treated differently than other taxpayers, and that's usually pretty hard to prove. But you know, if your unit is exactly like 10 other units and they've um, assessed all the other 10 units at 30% less than yours, that might be more along the discrimination claim. 
Um, the other one is the just value or fair market value claim, which is to say that the assessor just got the number wrong. And they could have gotten the number wrong for a number of different reasons. One could be that they didn't apply the right methodology for calculating value. So for example, uh, for certain commercial properties, um, the income valuation approach might be the proper way to value the property. Um, there are different ways you can value real estate. You can value it based on the income method, based on comparable sales, uh, comp method, or based on what's called replacement value, what it would cost to build that particular property at this point in time. Replacement value, given construction costs, is likely to, to yield the highest number, but in most cases, it's not reflective of fair market value, and so it wouldn't be the appropriate methodology to use. Um, if you're not happy with the valuation after the informal appeal, what's going to happen is the city is going to commit the taxes. Once the taxes are committed, you would file a formal appeal. Um, the formal appeal would go to the municipal assessor. They have a period of time to review it. Um, you have to file that formal appeal within six months. A lot of folks at that point, if they're serious enough to go through a formal appeal, um, might continue to work with Tom or another valuation expert. You might even get an appraisal at that point. Um, after that period of time goes by, if the uh, municipal assessor rejects your application, you would go to uh, Municipal Board of Assessment Review, the Portland Board of Assessment Review. Assuming that they uh, support the assessor, you can then go um, in some cases to the State Board of Assessment Review. That's for commercial properties valued at over a million dollars. You can then go to Superior Court, and after Superior Court, you can go to the main Supreme Judicial Court. So you have a lot of places you can appeal to if you really think the number's off. The problem is it's time and money, and it's a very uh, long and expensive process if you're hiring uh, consultants and lawyers. So you want to make sure that if you're going to go down this road, the, the tax savings are worth it. So what do you have to do to figure that out? You have to take what you think the property is worth, what the city has assessed it as, and you get a delta, right? So let's say that delta is $100,000. You now apply the mill rate. So if the mill rate is $14 or $15 per thousand, then you may be talking about a relatively modest amount of tax, $1,400 a year or $1,500 a year. I know that's a lot to some people. I'm not saying that that's not impactful. I'm just saying that that may not justify going to court, hiring lawyers, etc. So typically, when I am working with an owner who is doing a formal abatement and taking it beyond just the informal appeal, um, we're talking about discrepancies of a million dollars or over, um, typically. Um, so the informal process is great for the residential property owner who feels the unit is 100000 or 200000 overvalued. The formal abatement process is going to be more with your, uh, someone who's got, you know, many, 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 many apartment units, big buildings, um, and, and probably a lot more uh, tax dollars at stake. Yeah, we have seen, Charlie, the um, increase being quite extraordinary on some properties that, um, uh, again, are in these areas which have had rapid increases in prices where um, they could be valued uh, in the past and, and never really having changed uh, at even two or three hundred thousand dollars. And I just had a client reach out to me and say that their value went from four hundred ish thousand up to over $2 million uh, in the assessed value. So uh, have they made improvements? Yes. Uh, is, it a, is it a nice property? Yes. But you know that, that is a significant delta uh, there, obviously. And uh, those are folks, too, that you know, may want to, uh, I'm sure they're not going to get um, uh, the abatement that they're thinking or the adjustment that they're thinking. But they, they may want to do that as well, even if it's not you know, in the 2 or 3 or $4 million range. So we also have some, um, you know, ways that people can reduce, uh, and, and maybe Charlie, you can talk about that. That uh, they may be taking advantage of now, or may not be uh, you know, blind exemptions, uh, homestead exemptions. Uh, there are forms online uh, for people to to take advantage of some of these uh, things. 
um, and they can fill those out and submit those to the city. Uh, so that's an important thing. It, it doesn't make a tremendous impact on the amount of tax, but I, I think you want to take a, advantage of everything you possibly can. Yeah, and there, there are veterans and all kinds of programs to, to help with the tax burden and for the elderly and so forth. But um, as you said, Tom, I don't, I don't think that's, you know, the people are really going to be looking right now at the informal abatement process, and that that should be relatively straightforward and relatively low cost. And I think that the, the big thing to figure out is you work with someone like Tom and you figure out, is the number off? Um, as you said, Tom, a property may have been valued at 400, it's now valued at 2 million. The question is, is 2 million fair market value? Is that just value? Is that what someone would get if they went to sell the property? Um, and if the answer is yes, then it's not, then the abatement's not going to go very far. If the answer is no, that property is only worth 1.5, well, okay, it's, the 400 was clearly off, but there's still room for potentially a $500,000 abatement, which, you know, that might be seven, seven $8,000 of tax a year. Now you're starting to get into, um, uh, you know, a substantial amount of, of money that, that might be worth hiring. Um, experts to, to pursue that for you. The other thing I would mention is it's the value on April 1. So when the assessor values taxes, it's what was that property worth on April 1st? If it's a vacant lot on April 1st and on August uh, 15th you complete construction of a five unit building, um, that property for that year is valued as a vacant lot. The next year they'll capture the value of the five unit building. So it's, a, it's an interesting uh, snapshot in time. That's a very good point. You know, so when you're hiring somebody to potentially do a market analysis, um, uh, or in the future, uh, let's face it, you you may have an appraisal um, that uh, let's say you purchased something in, in May of this year, uh, and that was appraised or, or June. Uh, that's potentially not relevant uh, unless the comps pulled in that appraisal. Uh, are prior to that April 1 date. Uh, you can't use comps after that. So uh, whether that's a broker price opinion or an appraisal, um, you know, we, we do have situations where people who just purchased the property uh, have an appraisal, and again, we have to potentially try to modify that. But the timeline, again, is so tight. Uh, we're recommending to homeowners that if you're not uh, in agreement with this, or even if you say, hey, does this sound right or doesn't sound right, you can reach out to, to my team, and I have their information, we'll send around the documents, and we can give you a very quick snapshot of whether we think that's in the ballpark uh, or high. Um, keep in mind that, it, it, although unlikely, uh, you, they do want to have images of your unit. If you think back to uh, the people who uh, contacted you in the letters we received in the past or your building, um, they typically would give you the option of pouring them through and showing them the property or they would use the existing information about your, your property. Um, obviously, uh, they uh, don't tour all the properties. Uh, they take pictures from the outside and they rely on their viewing from the exterior of the property on the condition of the property and um, uh, the past information about whether the property is in A condition, B, C, D, and F, um, and, and the square footage and bedrooms and baths. So they're taking that and rolling that forward. And um, you know, if you have a property that you feel is in a, in, a, in a significantly inferior position, that's where it gets into some of that documentation that they discuss. Uh, and we do have that on here. They want to have photos. They want to have an appraisal. They want to have the sales comparables, a broker opinion. And finally, any other documentation that may show details which affect the value of your property. Uh, so again, we're, we're, the idea here is obviously it's too much, it's too high. But you know, once you start taking photos, um, you know, just be aware that there is the possibility that they could say, oh, it's actually nicer than we thought. Uh, we don't think that's going to be the case, uh, but it is. There is a remote possibility of that happening as well. Um, yeah. So uh, again, we have a, a, a summary sheet here. There's an 800 number to go on to to schedule your appointment. There's also we put together a nice, easy, scannable QR code that you can use to uh, go into that portal. 
And that, uh, there are two ways based on, uh, like Charlie was saying, using the commercial property. Um, and if you do have a commercial property or a residential property and you have multiples, they ask you to, to group those all together and, and book it for one meeting, whether that be a 20 minute meeting or a half hour meeting. Uh, with uh, the representative from Tyler. Uh, Charlie, do you have a sense of how those are working or how that might work? Is Tyler then taking that, putting that together, and does a city official make the final call on that? Yeah, so uh, it's a, uh, I don't have a great sense of that yet, Tom. Um, what I would say is that there's a lot more flexibility at the municipal level prior to the taxes being committed. Here's essentially how property taxes work. The, the city has a budget, and, that, and the, the city council and the, and the city manager and so forth work on a budget, and that's to fund all the services the city provides, from schools to police to fire to roads. They have to pay for that budget. So they assess all of the properties, figure out what the total valuation of the taxable property is in the city, and then come up with the mill rate, which is the percentage, basically, that they need to apply in order to generate the tax to pay for the city's budget. Um, when the commitment date happens, which is at the end of this informal appeal period in August, um, they pretty much committed A, to the budget, and B, to what they think the values are of these properties um, in order to generate the revenue that they need to generate to fund the city. So prior to committing the taxes, they have some flexibility to adjust property values up and down, which will just affect the mill rate. So if they reduce everybody's property tax valuation by 20%, the mill rate will just go up 20% because they still have to generate the same amount of money for the city budget. Once the commitment date hits and, and those property values are fixed, the municipality has a much lower incentive at that point to negotiate values, right? Because at that point, they're kind of stuck with, with the numbers. And so that's when you're going to the formal appeal process. And the formal appeal process, it's hard to get uh, to have a lot of success with the city or the municipal board of review for the reasons I've just articulated, which is at that point, the city needs to fund their budget. And so they don't have a large incentive to start decreasing tax revenue. So um, it's not really until you go to the state board for commercial properties or superior court that you get a really neutral look. And I think it's kind of a good opportunity maybe to kick it over to Roy, where if you are in that situation, if you are a taxpayer who has filed a formal abatement and then appealed it to Superior Court to talk about what that process might look like, um, who, what's the record, um, what type of experts you might need, and so forth. Thanks, Charlie. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is where is it that you're going to make your case? So if you're a residential taxpayer, you're going to be making your case in front of the Board of Assessment Review in Portland. And it's from there that you're going to end up in Superior Court. So the evidentiary record is really what is being presented to the Municipal Board. You might not feel like you're going to get a fair shake there because, you know, you're asking the, the municipality that you allege over-assessed you to drop, the, to drop the assessment. But it's important that you recognize that that's where you're making your factual record. And you're going to be left stuck with that factual record going forward. Now, the beauty for the uh, commercial owners who have properties assessed over a million dollars is you kind of get a second bite at the apple because when you go to the state board of property tax review it's a de novo hearing which which basically means you, you get to start afresh so you, you basically get a second bite at the apple there and then your um, appeal goes to the superior court from there so you never want to lose sight of the fact of where am i going to be able to present this information you know um I think the reaction from a lot of people is, is to assume that they're not going to get a fair shake at the municipal level, I'll wait till I get to Superior Court. And at that point, it's likely too late. The record is going to be set. So your, your evidence is going to come in, you know, the evaluation, if you've got someone like Tom who's doing a, 
uh, an opinion of value or you've got an appraiser or whatnot, um, you, you need to have them lined up and ready to go in presenting this to the kind of the forum of origin, so to speak, um, to get that in the record. Because once you get that appeal to the superior court, it's all based upon a paper record that was developed below. The parties draft write briefs. There may be an oral argument in front of a superior court judge, and then a uh, decision gets gets rendered, and then you've got 20, uh, 21 days to figure out if you want to take an appeal to the state Supreme Court, where once again, the record is locked in, and you're doing a different round of brief, and you've got the seven judges of the state Supreme Court uh, determining whether um, there were any, really any legal legal uh, legal errors that were made in the process below. One of the kind of infuriating aspects of all of this for, for most folks is that when you get to the state Supreme Court, they essentially ignore what the Superior Court did below. So you know, you, yeah, I think you rightly get the feeling once you're up in the state Supreme Court of well, why did I have to go through that process in the Superior Court? And the answer is because the state government says you have to. Um, I think the I think the argument is is it's an opportunity to kind of weed some cases out. You know, people get a they get a look from a superior court judge in a case, and then they can make the determination whether it's cost effective or worth it to them to take the next step and get in front of the, the full seven member state supreme court. The other the other thing that you need to keep in mind is what you need to show uh, when you're in the, that form of origin, so to speak, and I've seen it happen, and usually I've seen this happen just simply because I have served for quite a few years on my municipal assessment review board, is it's not enough to poke holes with the methodology used by the assessor. You've also got to come forward with affirmative proof of what you think the value is. And a lot of people get hung up on that. A lot of people that I've seen to come to front of me sitting as a member of the assessment review board is they do a pretty good job of poking holes in some of the methodology that the assessor used and they're they're happy and they sit down and that's it and then it comes time for us to write the opinion and we're writing an opinion that says too bad you've lost you haven't carried your burden because they haven't gone the next step and said that this property that you think is worth uh, you assessed at 700, they never put the competing number out there. So although they do a good job of attacking the $700,000 assessment, they don't come forth with the evidence that shows that the property is really worth 500, and they lose on that basis. So it's a kind of a kind of a trap for the unwary um, in that regard. Um, so. Just keep, like, and Charlie mentioned, you know, the, the discrimination or it's not reflective of just value. Um, you know, just always keeping in mind what it is you need to prove and where you're going to have your opportunity to present your evidence is key. Because, like I said, once you get into the court system, we're just talking about reading a record, a written record that might be six inches tall of, um, minutes of an assessment review board, documents that were presented by the taxpayer, maybe a transcript of what happened at the assessment review board, um, and then lawyers writing arguments and briefs to judges based upon that. So the, 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 opportun the opportunities to supplement the record made below are very, very limited. And, and I guess to bring it back to kind of where we started, it's a two-phase approach, right? Phase one is an informal appeal, that's what we're in right now. That's your opportunity to present evidence to Tyler and negotiate and see if you can get the number down. And then more of what Roy and I do is the phase two approach, which is what happens if the, if the work with Tyler was not successful and you want to go with the for, uh, formal appeal. And the timeline for that would be six months after the commitment date. You essentially have 180 days after the taxes are committed in August. 
So, and, and, you know, what Roy was just mentioning about uh, this uh, meeting of origin um, it is very similar to what you're being charged, if, if you're the homeowner listening to this or, or here in the audience, uh, with doing and presenting to Tyler Tech, right? When you have your meeting and prior to, you're supposed to be out there garnering some of this information to help you uh, plead that case, as Roy was saying. So um, that is uh, sometimes a bit of a tall order with limited information. Uh, as many of us know, you can go on to uh, you know, the city's website and find out what other properties are valued at. You can potentially look back sometimes on, on past sales data. Uh, but it is a, uh, a tall task, a daunting task, and, and sort of a, a bit of an unfair ask, if I can go that far of the lay person to quickly say, hey, in two weeks, uh, I am going to, uh, or even three weeks in this case, uh, prior to that uh, August 6th deadline, uh, I'm going to go out, I'm gonna take pictures of my property, I'm gonna find sales comparables that really you know, challenge what the other value is that the uh, that Tyler Tech came up with. Uh, so again, what we recommend and what we're here to help out with is that we can help with that. We, we have access to all the comparables. We know the market. We have a very good understanding, me and my team, of how your property actually compares to things that they may be using. So back to Roy's point, it's not just in the courts that that is relevant. It's relevant in the next two to three weeks here as you hold your meeting or potential meeting with Tyler. You need to come into that meeting prepared, uh, again, not just to poke holes, and I think that was a very, very good point, uh, in what they've prepared or challenge that. Let me give you an alternative set of facts. Let me give you an alternative set of comps. And, and here's an expert's opinion uh, who specializes in my area uh, to understand uh, having gone through the data, uh, square footage, bedrooms, baths, level of finish. Here's why we feel uh, again, from a third party informal opinion, this property is overvalued by X. So here's the market value of that property. Um, so um, uh, that's, uh, again, what we have lined out here and we will circulate around is the step-by-step -step. July 21st, again, is that date that you have to call for that informal hearing to happen. Uh, there's a number, there's a, UR, uh, uh, a QR code for that and then there's some things that you need to do. And then you can book these things. When you send that information in, uh, you can send it into two different websites depending on whether your property is residential or commercial. Um, but again, the final date here is August 6th. That's coming right up. So there's, a, there's gonna be a mad dash, and I think that's why I'm fielding so many calls from folks that are pretty anxious about this because as Charlie and Roy say, once that's set, it becomes much more difficult to challenge that. Now, not to go too far back, but you know, after the 2008 crash, you know, we had the reverse thing happening in Portland. People's values were high, the comps were low, and people were coming to me in the 2010, 11, 12 range saying, hey, there's a host of foreclosures, there's a host of properties going short sale, they're valuing me at 500, my neighbor just sold at 350, this isn't right, there should be some some adjustment there. Uh, we have had good luck in that. It's the same process here. It's an information process where we do an evaluation of the property, whether it's a piece of land, a condo, and we do have to walk through uh, or do a FaceTime tour of the property. And then we can dive into the comps and very quickly help you prior to your meeting with Tyler, uh, get some more ammunition and be here as a resource for you to challenge this. Uh, we cannot expect, and, and again, going back to the idea of how this process happened, uh, they did not tour every property. They do not know what the heating systems are, or whether it has this finish or that finish. So um, we need to inform them, especially if they got it wrong on the upside, obviously. So maybe this concludes the first part of that meeting, um, and we can turn it out to some questions from, from the audience here. Uh, and some other ones that came in. And I'll start off with one that came in um, uh, just this morning about, um, it, as we know, the city of Portland has a tremendous amount of multifamily dwellings. We also know that there is a rent control that is in place. Uh, uh, several folks have, have asked the question, 
hey, um, my taxes on my multifamily have gone up exponentially, right? Uh, how can I and can I, uh, with rent control, pass that on? Uh, because uh, it certainly doesn't seem fair if I can't. So what's the, what's the analysis there, Charlie? So under rent control in Portland, um, every September 1, the city is going to let you know as a landlord what is the allowable increase percentage. So that, that's kind of the starting base. And, and it's supposed to be tied to CPI. So basically, if CPI is up 4%, then um, September 1, they'll probably say for your next lease year, you can raise the rent by up to 4%. Um, there are some exceptions to that rule. Now, there is something in the ordinance that's called the tax rate rent adjustment. My reading of the ordinance is that it does not apply to this re-evaluation, and here's why. The idea is that um, if your tax burden increases significantly, you should that should be factored in and potentially allow you to increase your rent above and beyond the... Um, the allowable increase percentage, but it's tied to the mill rate. And as I explained a little bit earlier, the mill rate in Portland has actually gone down. So um, if your property value has gone up, even if your property tax has gone up, um, I don't think the tax rate rent adjustment kicks in because the mill rate has not gone up. Now, um, also- hey, can I just jump in on that point, Charlie? You know, yeah. there's, there, there is, when you look at it, I think Charlie's got the right read on that. Um, you know, you can look at the, the language of the tax rate adjustment, and it says that it can be added if and only if the city changes the mill rate. Now, there have been changes in the mill rate here. The mill rate's actually gone down. So I, I think there's a textual argument that, you can still try to avail yourself of this on a on a tax rate rent adjustment. I think the better the argument is, unfortunately, Charlie's argument, which is there's really not much of a reason to um, mention mill rate in this new ordinance if it wasn't going. If it was, you know, there would be if if you got it across the board. Uh, tax rate rent adjustment, whether it was the product of a reval or a product of a mill rate increase, there would be no need to differentiate mill rate, uh, mill rate in the ordinance. Um, it's kind of a creative argument, though one I don't think is going to prevail. Um, so I think, I think Charlie is probably right. There is a second avenue that may provide some relief. So um, as we talked about, Roy just um, also kind of clarified saying about the, um, the tax increase, you can go to the rent board and you can explain why you have suffered some specific circumstances that should entitle you to have an increase above the allowable percentage increase. And they give a list of uh, four items that the rent board is allowed to consider in granting an additional rent increase which is capped at 10%. So if you're in this, if you're in this game, um, no matter what, your rent's not going to be able to be increased above 10%, but you might be able to get from, let's say, 3 or 4 or 5% CPI up to 10% if you can show one of these categories. And one of the categories is any additional increase within the opinion of the rent board required to allow the landlord to receive a fair rate of return. And so the idea here would be that even though the mill rate has gone down, if your property taxes went up significantly, and as a result, the rents that you're now charging um, do not provide a reasonable rate of return, um, you could potentially convince the rent board to allow you to increase your rents by more than the allowable increase, up to a maximum of 10%. Um, so in that in that one aspect, um, the you know this may be helpful for those who would like to raise their rents, but um, it's certainly not a, a silver bullet. Thank you, John. Thank you, Roy. Um, 
So I guess I want to turn it out to folks in the audience with particular uh, questions that they may have. Um, uh, speak loud. We may have to repeat them. Uh, but uh, any any thoughts, guys, or based on what we talked about? I don't want to go before the board. I don't want to ask <laughs> them if I can raise my rent. You know, yeah. just it just it just makes me mad. Right. I don't want to do that. Yeah. We're not going to do that. You made me think um, uh, of something that was Charlie was talking that triggered my mind. Is this is a brand new process, this board process, right? How quickly do we have a sense of that? How quickly are they hearing things? How would they come down on them? I don't know if it's a vote, an opinion, uh, what that looks like. Uh, have they been reasonable? I know the makeup of the board is is predominantly renters and and then some landlords. So uh, has, has this you know, again, even if let's just say somebody says, "Yeah, that 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 sounds great, Charlie. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to pursue that. Why wouldn't I?" Um, is it six months? Is it a year? Is it just a fool's errand? Because well, that's like John. It's like asking me who's gonna win the Super Bowl next year because <laughs> rent control um, really is is a new thing to Portland, and this September first will be the first time they come out with the allowable increase, and so. Um, I don't think the board has functioned in this capacity yet. And so it will only, we're going to learn this fall um, how quickly does the board hear people, uh, does the board have any empathy for landlords, and how quickly do they act? Um, as of right now, I think it's a giant question mark because it's a brand new board and they haven't done this yet. And it's complaint based, right? That's what I heard. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you don't, if your if your tenants are, you know, they like, wow, okay, well, you can raise the rent forever and not complain. I, I don't know. But right. is that the case, Sir Charlie? It would be you would either go to them proactively and say, "Can I do this?" Is is the intent of this right um, before you implement something? Correct. There is, yeah, you know, the ordinance has all kinds of notice provisions and various other provisions, but basically. You can't exceed the allowable rental increase without getting the approval of the rent board on the front end. Right. You can't exceed, but you can do up to. And this is an annual increase. You can go up to the five percent. Well, whatever it is, whatever it is, it's going to be different every year. They're going to announce what it is on September first, and it's tied to CPI, okay. which is. The consumer price index for those who don't know. Do you expect to see further restrictions on condo conversions as landlords just can't make a living? Uh, that, Karen, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I'll repeat it. Uh, are we anticipating uh, the potential for? Uh, the municipality uh, to further restrict or restrict uh, uh, buildings being converted to condos. Uh, you know, you bring up a very good point. Uh, I, I guess that was nothing I processed. Um, and um, you would think it would be more of a, a, a penalty sort of thing. You know, if you're going to do this, um, then we're going to uh, view it as removing housing stock and, and, and rental uh, stock, which you know, there's a need for more, or there's a belief of, uh, again, a need for more of that. Um, so I, I could see that as um, people potentially, uh, when faced with rent control, when faced with higher taxes, are saying, um, you know, if I can't, if I don't have a relief valve here, uh, maybe I do either sell or I convert to uh, condominiums. and. Um, and do what a client of mine did up on the east and wind up with, with a unit in her building and that type of thing. So, um, yeah, this falls under the law of unintended consequences. Um, and I think that what the point there is, is that um, the idea of rent control is not to diminish the rental stock and not to drive condo conversions. But I am sure that there are some landlords out there who are contemplating condo conversion because of rent control. Um, I, I don't know, I, I, I've long since given up on trying to predict um, policy, future policy, 
um, especially in places like Portland, where uh, you have to take the temperature of not just the city council and town government, but also the referendum. Um, right? I mean, some of these some of these things were not things that the city even wanted, frankly. At least city government didn't necessarily want. Um, so uh, it, it's hard to predict where policy is headed in a city that, that allows governance by referendum. But um, I would say that it is probably realistic that some landlords will pursue condo conversions because of rent control. Uh, I would agree with that, Charlie. We, we've seen it, we, and, and, I, and we've certainly had a lot of conversations. The tax bill just adds uh, an additional fuel to that fire and logic of whether it means, uh, again, selling or converting. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a challenging time when you potentially seemingly have no outlets for, for a significant right, increase. Yeah, and it would be worth noting, I apologize for interrupting now, uh, the, the, the downside of being remote is I, I can't uh, see you when you're talking, but um, there, there is also a condo conversion ordinance in Portland, so people should just be aware of the fact it's not like you just convert an apartment to a condo, you have to actually apply for a permit from the city, and there are requirements regarding notice to tenants and so forth. Um, if you have tenants, they may be entitled to a uh, right of first option to purchase. Um, they may even be entitled to some moving expenses and, and various other things. So there are um, there are potentially some challenges for landlords who want to do conversions, particularly if they have tenants who have been there for a long time and are not eager to leave. I agree, Charlie. You and I have done the analysis for several uh, uh, apartment building owners in Portland. And and sometimes, uh, you know, there's we could almost do a whole, you know, two or three hour segment on that alone. Um, but uh, it, it 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 can be something and a good vehicle for people, uh, especially again if they want to stay in a place. Uh, but there are those requirements. Uh, uh, there are costs associated with that, from setting up the condominium association to uh, having a survey done, etc. Uh, and then there is the the warranty factor afterwards. So. Uh, the the idea of just switching it over um, uh, it can happen. It can be a, a, a very uh, you know, good thing to do and, and and relatively easy. But there are hoops to run jump through. There's uh, again an ongoing warranty afterwards for at least a two year period, and uh, we can discuss some of that whether uh, it's a team effort of Charlie and I. So typically, what we do in that, and not to go too far down that, is we would look at the potential cost of the conversion and whether the units are condo ready, if you will, right? Because the idea of a condo unit is usually a little different than an apartment unit. And then we would go and say, hey, if you do that and it's six months to a year before they're on the market, usually the building is vacant. What We do a little bit of cost benefit analysis between that and either staying put or selling. And then we, we typically weigh those out and then we can help people move through that entire process. Uh, we've done a lot of work with uh, landlords uh, and developers moving properties from either a lot to uh, a new building or from an existing multifamily into condo. So we're very versed at that. And, and again, it's a team, uh, a lot of times between myself at Benchmark and Charlie uh, with the condos. Um, additional questions? The, uh, uh, two different processes, residential and commercial. Um, I presume the commercial and multi-units is the five units or more. Is that Correct. So the, the question was, what is the commercial? Um, and it is defined uh, on the website. Again, there's a lot of information uh, if you go on to um, uh, portlandmaine.gov and it's you know, there's a whole forward slash and other things that we'll, we'll send. It's a bit of a mouthful to, to spit out right now. Uh, but they outline that, and the residential uh, is a single family condo lot, uh, or they say up to a four unit building. Uh, once you go to five units or mixed use commercial warehouse, those type of things, you get into that additional or that other um, bucket there. Uh, and the two emails that you would send stuff to uh, after you book your appointments um, is portland underscore residential at outlook.com. And again, that's going to go straight out to Tyler Tech and provide them with that information. 
Uh, and again, they want the photos, they want an appraisal if you've had one in that last year from April 1st going back to April 1st a year ago. Sales comparables, broker opinions, and any other documentation. So as Charlie said on the commercial, it is going to be a bit, a bit of a different thing. You know, on the residential side, um, really you wouldn't get into the income approach. Uh, but if you have a six unit building or you have a big mixed use building, you would do, I think, both. You would do this income approach and then you would also do some sales comparable approaches. And going back to what Roy is saying, you're trying to come up with that value in a couple of those. Here's, here's what we're, we're coming to you with information. And at the end of that analysis, just like an appraisal, we're coming up with a value that we think it is to help round out their opinion. So if, if a Tyler Tech is saying it's worth $2 million and you're saying it's worth $1.5, maybe there can be some two or $300,000 meeting in the middle. Anything else? Anything at all online? Um, we had one question from someone named Audrey just asking for the process to reach out for help. Okay. And we replied to that in the comments. And she said, thank you so much for doing this presentation. <laughs> um, we've, had, we've had a solid amount of people in here this whole time. So okay, wonderful. Good. Thanks, Audrey. So just a review. Uh, we have, again, an information sheet we're going to be posting on Benchmark's blog. You can go on to benchmarkmainlikethestate.com. And uh, we will have uh, a summary of, you know, the multiple, multiple pages that the city has available. And again, it's all great information, but it can be a little bit daunting. What are, what are the cliff notes? What are the bullets that I need to know? That's on this side about the informal appeal process. And then on the back side of the sheet, and we'll have this all online, is how Jensen Baird can help and how Benchmark can help. Um, so you've got a, a very short period of time between today and the 21st to go online, schedule that appointment with, this, with, with Tyler Tech. It's a very easy process to set up. Um, and again, we're going to give you a QR code that you can scan on the smartphone that takes you right to their website. But you want to do this as soon as you possibly can.